all day's wound, she said. Hello and welcome to Get Up The Hour, Don. Don, your MC of sorts. And this week I'm joined by Sean and Luxie, and we're going to be discussing the disappearance of Trevor Dealey. Trevor Dealey was a young man from Nice in Ireland and at the age of 22 went to his company night out, Christmas night out, on a wet, miserable December night. Also where it was a taxi strike and after leaving his party, went back to his place of work, had a coffee with a friend and was never heard from or seen again. So, what happened with Trevor Dealey? Well, basically, he was attending, attending an office Christmas party on the 7th of December. And after having drinks in Copperface Jacks and the Hilton Hotel, the party moved to Buck Whaley's nightclub in Lower Leeson Street. Uh, Dealey left the Bucky Whaley's at about 3.25 a.m. And then he started walking in the direction of his apartment in Balls Bridge. Uh, that night, there was a heavy storm and also there was gusts of 60 to 70 miles per hour and there was also a taxi strike. About 10 minutes after leaving the nightclub, Dealey arrived at his office, which was the Bank of Ireland, and was left let in after calling security. While in his office, Dealey made a cup of tea, spoke to a colleague, whose name is Carl Pender, and basically checked his emails. And they also spoke about the gossip, what was going on, and also wanted to know what he had basically facing him on his uh, on his uh, day in work, which was about 8 a.m. that morning. He left the office at about 4.03, took an umbrella with him, and he continued in direction of his apartment in Bald's Bridge. Uh, around this time, he did ring a friend in Nace and basically said, Hi, Glenn, I miss you there. Just on my way home, I'll go to talk to you tomorrow. And that was the last contact anybody had. Uh, at about 4.15am, CCTV footage shows Dealey walking past what was then an AIB bank on the corner of Bagger Street and Haddington Road in the direction of his apartment. About 30 seconds later, a man dressed in black passed by the AIB bank and Gardy believed that this man is directly involved in the disappearance of Trevor Dealey. Uh, this happened in the year 2000 and I remember when I was in town, I was doing a bit of work uh, for a radio studio at the time. And I remember seeing posters of this guy all over the place. And, well, 19 years later, we still have no idea uh, what's happened to Trevor Dealey. Sean, start with yourself. This is really a guy who disappeared off the face of the earth, is it not? It would seem that way, yeah. Uh, like you said, he hasn't been seen since. Um, I, yeah, I think I'm not sure if you mentioned, but while he was coming and going from his office, uh, there was another guy in black that he briefly spoke to outside. Yeah. And it's kind of disputed whether it's the same person who was following after him, but it's it's generally considered that it is the same person. Although I kind of have my doubts myself because the kind of the material of the jackets looked like they're slightly different. But um, I suppose the night that was in it, there were so many people walking because of, like you said, the, the taxi strike. Yeah. Um, you know, it wouldn't have been unusual for a lot of people to be walking at that time. You know, it was around Christmas time, so there was a lot of people in town. Tours and night is actually busy enough in Dublin. Um, yeah, so I suppose after that, he he obviously he had an apartment on uh, in Balls Bridge, which he shared with two other people. They were away that weekend as well, so he there was no kind of the the uh, the alarm wasn't raised until the, the following Monday. Because although he was due in work on the Friday, him going missing on a Thursday, Thursday night, Friday morning, uh, they basically kind of wrote, wrote it off saying like, look, he probably had a few drinks, maybe he's a little bit hungover, so we're not going to really yeah. worry him too much. And then, of course, the, the entire weekend went away without anyone suspecting him of being missing. His family thought he was up shopping in Dublin. So, they, you know, they, they had a couple of missed calls that, you know, some people said his phone did ring out, which I, I think we'll come back to uh, anyway, because... Um, you know, there is a lot of theories about what happened to him. Uh, I suppose yeah. should we go through a few of them now. Um, I, I suppose one of the most prevalent theories was that, you know, it being a very wet night, he uh, might have fallen in uh, the canal on the way home. And, you know, it, the, the, this, the, uh, the levels of water might have raised enough that he might have been swept out to the sea, you know. And now in saying that, I don't really think that because there was no body ever found. And 
you know, he obviously had that big golf umbrella with him, which was never retrieved either. But um, yeah. that is not that unusual because there was a Clinton visit that weekend or the following week, and the whole of Dublin was cleaned, particularly that area. So every little bit of trash was picked up and, you know, something like an umbrella at the time, you know, remember him, he wasn't reported missing until the Monday, could have been picked up at any stage. So there, there is a possibility of that as well. And then there's Sean, you're breaking up there, mate. Sorry, that. sorry. is it the, uh, me, Mike? Any better? I can hear you clearly, Sean. It's probably your connection, Tony. Anyway, um, there's also the, uh, the more sinister theory of him being attacked, possibly abducted. Uh, you know, possibly uh, murdered, and it could have been the guy following after him could have something to do with it. Uh, I'm not so sure. What do you think yourselves, lads? Do you have any thing that you might? I know it's just, there's very little to go on, but uh, there's, there's very little to go on. Um, one thing I find and I find extremely peculiar is why was he in an office, his own workplace, at quarter past three in the morning after a Christmas party night out? Well, I think. What? I, I, I can't conceive of I can't conceive of any rational reason well, why you sorry you sorry, sorry was, unless, unless he was trying to retrieve something on his computer and then you have to question Shut what he hello yeah, come in there and I was hello yeah uh, I think for, for going back to the office it is on the face I think it is a little bit kind of you know why would he bother going back after a night I think, out, a, I think it's extremely strange but I think him he knew he had about a what a fifteen twenty minute walk ahead of him. I think he just went to pick the umbrella. Up. I don't think there's anything more than that. Um, yeah. He just he knew his mate was working that uh, the night shift. You know he had a you know he needed to have a cup of tea before the the walk home. I don't think there's anything much more to it. And I, he also went on his computer to check check his emails, which some people sort of flagged as suspicious as well. But then you know this was 1999. A lot of people didn't have you certainly didn't have it on your phone the ability to check email. You might, you, you know, you, some people would have the internet at home at that stage, but uh, a lot of people wouldn't, you know. So your your office might have been your only access to your email at that at that stage, and you know, I think we, we could sort of pick, pick these things apart, but I don't think it's all that suspicious, really. No, you got to be careful that um, you know we're not judging it. You got to remember this is this is two thousand, you know, this is in two thousand nineteen where we were, we all have smartphones and stuff. Um, so we can't judge it by the standard of today's standards. You know, you got to look at it 2000. I, I, and I, I hear what you're saying there, Sean, because I remember, well, we had internet um, in, a, in our house. We were one of the first ones to have it. So but it was a total tech geek, or is a total tech mm-hmm. geek. Um, but it cost, like, it was like a penny a minute. And we used to get phone bills of like over 100 pounds, Irish pounds. You know, it was, but it's only a penny a minute. So yeah, to, to, to check your emails and, you know, emails were a novelty back then and, and all that. I, I mean, and also a guy going in, I mean, normally you wouldn't go into your office with drink on you and you wouldn't normally allow somebody uh, to go into an office with drink on you. But then again, that's 2019 standards. So it is unusual, but, but I think for 2000, I don't think that's too unusual if that sort of makes sense. But like another thing as well is that there were no clear reports of him being in like heavily intoxicated on the night either. He was, uh, I think Carl Pender mentioned in one of the documentaries I've seen, he said that he had a few drinks on him. He, he described him yeah. as, he wouldn't describe him as being locked, but he said that he, you know, he had a few drinks. He was drinking for a few hours. So he obviously, he would have been fairly well on, I would imagine. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the one thing that would make me disregard that he accidentally fell into the canal. And I know it, that does happen, but yeah. for the most part, it happens at night time, at a specific time, after someone has presumably been drinking a lot, and I don't think there were, as far as I know, he seems to be the type of guy that would have a few drinks and it'd be absolutely fine. And I think that night, especially given that it was a work night, he probably would have been more conscious of the amount of alcohol that he was consuming. So yeah. it seems less likely to me that he walked home and fell in, in a canal, especially in an area that he's, like, you know, he's on the way home. He knows the area inside out. Yeah, and if you look at his route where he was going, he he could have potentially avoided all the canals anyway. It could have Absolutely, been a straight yeah. uh, urban walk home, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I, like unless people know Dublin, that area of Dublin is, you could reasonably say it's a very safe area of Dublin. You have very little to worry about on your walk home. Um, yeah, there there is around Leeson Street. It's uh, I think it is now, but it certainly was then a, a well known red light district. Which oh, was it? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. so that's also oh dear the foreigner <laughs> so 
so what? It's, I, there's something shameful about not knowing where you can go to pick up a hooker, is there? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. Supposed to be a red, <laughs> you're supposed to be a red-blooded man, Jay. You're supposed to know these things. Um, I'm, I'm well, very that, proud to say I never know about that. Well, you know, what I'm saying is with that goes along with drugs, with pimps, you know, there is gangland connections to these places, you know, so he could have come into trouble. Now, there was a theory of people saying that he might have come across a drug deal or something like that, but I, I don't think that would be the case because any drug dealer, if you if you saw them drug dealing, they're not they're just going to shrug. They're not going to be interested in being caught. Like, you know, it's not going to be enough of a threat that they would murder you and bury you somewhere. I wouldn't imagine anyway. I suppose it's worth mentioning that uh, was it last year, the year before, uh, due to a tip off, someone said that um, Trevor Dealey was abducted and killed and buried in a kind of waste ground area in Castle Knock. Yeah. And it turned out to be, they didn't find anything. They found some drugs and I think they found a gun, but obviously they didn't find a body. So we're not really sure what to make of that. You know, is that is that false information? Is it a clue? I'm not sure. There's a lot of potential red herrings in this case, not to mention the fact that he was abroad. He was in um, Anchorage, Alaska. Um, Chasing a bit of tail, apparently. That's what it seems to me. It just seemed like he met a girl from America, went over to see her. I don't think it worked out very well for him, but uh, his brother apparently, even uh, said apparently he, only met her, he only met this girl once. Yeah, which seemed a bit keen. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, that, that, that is very strange. And I know I know it has been done before, and I think you'd always have to question it. But it's yeah. definitely something that you'd have to put on the suspicious side of the list because it's not something that the ordinary person would do, given the expense and the time that it would take to travel over there to see someone that you barely know. Um, yeah. it's a uh, rare thing to do but I wouldn't discount it as absolutely suspicious but he, it was a young lad you know, he, he probably had a lot of uh, you know uh, money for you know uh, spending money sort of thing you know it, it probably wouldn't take much for him to just sort of say you know what I'm going to go up to, to yeah, uh, Alaska so. He could have just gone back to Coppers, though. It would have been a much cheaper expense. <laughs> I'm looking for a particular thing. <laughs> uh, another theory. Now, this is one I lean towards myself, is that obviously there was a taxi strike that night. And you know some people, when they have a few drinks on them, they still think they can drive. And I'm sure there was a lot of people driving that night. With a, they were well over the limit. And there is this theory that he might have been struck by a drink driver who quickly bundled him into the car and then maybe over that weekend or the following week disposed of him. Um, I think that's where I, I wouldn't say that that's what I actually fully believe, but I think that's what I lean towards because he didn't seem like he would have a lot of enemies. He didn't seem like someone would want, you know, this isn't a mugging because, you know, you don't bury a body of someone you mug, even if you stab someone, even if they die, you don't, try and bury evidence i wouldn't imagine so anyway no no a, m- a mugging is a hit you know not talking from experience now uh, but, but but you know mugging is opportunistic isn't it? Yes. It, 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 it it's not like oh shit i've killed this person by accident i better cover it up it's fuck yeah. i better get out of here because you know a mugging fun. is smash and grab yeah, yeah. now uh, there's one thing that we're not mentioning or we, we very briefly touched on is the man in black that was outside his job Yes. Um, before he went there, this guy was standing outside his place of work for, I think it was roughly 30 minutes before he even arrived. And then as he's coming over, he's on the phone, he's talking to a mate of his, then this guy sort of follows him into that sort of laneway into the job and then briefly talks to him for a few seconds. And then yeah. if that is the same guy that's following him afterwards, that is extremely suspicious. And he, this guy, it's, it's worth to know for the record, has never come forward. We don't have a clue who this guy is. So I suppose he is probably the a very important piece to this puzzle. Yeah, I mean, why, why was there, though? Like, it was very strange to me, like, there's people standing outside his job. Yeah. Just that, with the hands in their pockets. Yeah, but, but yeah. all the buildings on that street, that was the one building where there was a, a small congregation of people. Yeah. Now, in saying that, remember, there was no taxis that night, so there could have been people waiting for lifts, there could have been people chancing their arm on people coming out of work saying, look, can you get yeah. me home? It is, yeah. uh, on the surface, it is very suspicious. But then, Yeah, but at the, yeah, but at the same time, why were they, you know, the, there were three men at one time um, seen outside the building. Why were at least two of them oh. directly looking toward the CCTV camera? And That's generally, like, if, you're, if you're waiting for a taxi, you'd have your back turned and you'd have your, your face facing the road. Yeah, those those three people when there was two, they were co-workers of Trevor. They they were cleared, 
Um, yeah. They, oh, yeah. They well, get into well, what, well, what were they doing there that time of night, though? Well, they were doing a shift. They were they were going to do their night shift. Oh, um, right, okay. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, I, I, I thought the same thing myself, but it turned out that that was just a screen grab. It might have been a one second look up at the camera. So it, now it looks very suspicious, but it turns out that they were just, they were they were cleared, they were talked, they were spoken to, and they were just basically walking in the same shift as Carl Penda. All right, fair enough. That's that's okay. Didn't see, know I, I, see, I don't know. I, I think, you know, as a young lad, 22, mm. uh, you know, he seemed like a nice guy. You know, not very well liked. Yeah, he seemed like he had a great social life, a very good working life as well. Seemed like a very, yeah. very nice fellow, right? Yeah, worked hard, play hard. Uh, I mean, he, he was a he, well, he, you know, but he, um, I, I mean, <laughs> what's so funny about that, Luxie? I, I don't know, it's just the way you said it, as if you, well, as, as if you recognize something in him that you see in yourself. I don't, I don't know, funny. it's the way you said it. Are you saying I don't work hard? <laughs> don't play. No, we're we'll talking about Trevor Deity here, okay? All right. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, you know, big job, IT department at the time was, was quite a niche, um, you know, thing to be like everything is, is IT now. Um, he, was, he was doing quite well, young lad, a lot of money, cash on the hip, successful. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you know, you see somebody on the outside and you go, yeah, you know, lovely fella wouldn't harm, you know, wouldn't get involved in anything, but I don't know. Is there a chance maybe he got involved in something, got a little Absolutely. bit in over, over his Absolutely. head? I mean, I think so. He, he's, possible. yeah, I, I mean, he's not going to tell you, he's not going to go up and say, oh, by the way, somebody's approached. I well, could, there is a, another uh, kind of more conspiracy related theory about right. you know the, the, the brand she was in was asset management the Bank of Ireland that's what we're interested in Sean <laughs> that's what we have you on the panel for Sean but uh, yeah he was obviously in assets management in Bank of Ireland now this is during the boom obviously you know before you uh-huh. know, there was a lot of money exchanged you know we look back yeah. at it now and we think how the fuck did some of these people get away with some of the shit they were doing and um, we're, there is a kind of a suspicion is did he discover something some irregularities what have you and then was you know maybe this was plotted you know that he was like, bumped off because he knew yeah. too much or something along those lines we still don't really know there's no real you know it's 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 a very mysterious case but there's so many there's so little information at the moment even the CCTV footage had to be tracked down by I think Trevor's family you know, because as they said about the guard, they're very good at reacting to information, but they're not so good at being proactive and finding out what's going no, on. No, I, I mean, uh, you know, and I want to get back to that in a second, but I mean, what I was thinking, you know, I, I can remember from my own experience when I was young and I started uh, working in the bookies and that was good money. And, you know, you had access to a lot of money, you know, a lot of cash. I don't know what it's like now. I haven't worked in a long time, which is probably for the best. And uh, I'd come across some conversations and you get introduced to certain people. And, uh, you know, you know yourself, Lance, when you're in Dublin, you don't know who you're talking to. Like, you really don't. You go, oh, this is my mate here or he's my cousin's uh, friend. And you, you try to be really, really, really nice to them because you really, really don't know what the connections are. They could be have none, but you just don't know. And I would get introduced to some people and, you know, oh, so you're working at Bucky's, yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you know you get must get a lot of money. Well, yeah, you know you, you know the bookies always wins. I go yeah, you know you kind of laugh off. Yeah, sure. So you must have access to the safe, and then you're sort of going, mm, this conversation's taking a weird uh, turn. And you know most of the time you get batted away, but I remember one time I'll never forget. I was at a twenty first birthday party years ago, and these lads were actually tr- were actually trying to get me on into their plot of they'll come into the shop, hold a knife to me on camera and then I'll give them all the money out of the safe and then they'll split the money three ways I don't know I'd say they probably probably just seen Ocean's Eleven yeah I was just like yo I'm thinking right that's like I would say I'm laughing at first and then I got 
she's trying to say, I'm laughing first of all. It's like, well, this is clearly a joke. Then I realized they're serious. I'm like, I got to, second of all, where are the exits? I need to get the fuck out of here. Third of all, I was like, oh, you know, come on, let's, then I'm, you know, they're really, really into this. And then I'm trying to talk them out of it because like, you know, it's a bollocks plan and it's got more holes in it than my socks. And they're like really serious about it. And I, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, alarm bells ringing. I made my excuses. I got the fuck out of there. And, you know, you're kind of thinking, you kind of wonder, maybe something happened with Trevor where he's talking away. Oh, yeah, I do. The, you know, a few drinks on him. Naive, he's young, you know, mm. um, as we all were, you know. And I'm a cynical old bastard these days, as I'm sure as we all are now. You are, especially, Luxy. And, yeah, you know, no, I know. It's good. You're weary, weary old man. And, uh, you know, maybe he's got into a conversation with somebody in a pub or in a nightclub. You know, uh, what do you do? Oh, dude, I'm an asset manager. Oh, really? So you have all sorts of stuff. And, you know, getting the information out of them. And you don't know. Um, maybe there was a plot. Maybe there wasn't a plot. Or maybe there was an attempt at a plot. Maybe, as you say, Sean, came across something. Now, you know, it's um, far-fetched. But uh, there, there is that element. If you, if you are out in Dublin especially, you just never know who you're talking to. And to just no. dis- disappear off the face of the earth like that, it sounds outlandish. But that's, you know, it's, it's to just disappear like that sounds very, does sound very gangland to me. Uh, to me, to me, like the way, the way I've thought about it is, is, and it's just something that you, that you mentioned there. Well, I'm not criticizing you for saying it either, Donny. Um, the suspicion and or the, 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 sorry, the perception that you'd always have of a young person starting off a career in a big city is that they've very, you know, they've disposable income. They'd have cash on the hip. They can go mm-hmm. out and enjoy themselves. But, you know, as you get older, you kind of realize that you were absolutely terrible with money when you were younger. Yeah. Um, your cash management is something that you develop with experience and through age. So, and taking that into account, yes, I'm sure uh, Trevor Daly, especially in the position that he was in IT 19 years ago, it's impressive today, let alone 19 years ago. He must be an absolute risk kid to understand coding, to understand the mechanics of the computer, uh, to surf the internet, all the things that he would have done. He, I'm sure he would have been far ahead of a lot of people, not in his own age, but in his profession. By all accounts, he's a very intelligent guy. But people are people. Uh, chill, you know, and he was relatively still, he was still a child to some extent. Um, he was a very young man. So... Do I think that he would have had the experience to deal with his money that well? Probably not, which leaves the possibility, as you just mentioned there, Tony, that he could have, by chance, bumped into someone that would have realised the position that he was in and taken advantage of that. And yeah. Trevor being who he was um, and being a bright kid, and especially bright when it comes to, to computers, and being able to erase <clears throat> any activity that he would have conducted that could have been deemed to be illegal, would have had the expertise to get away with it and keep it a secret. And another thing I remember when I watched the documentary, which you just passed on to me, was very good, is that his parents consistently said that he was a very, very good kid and a very, very nice guy. And by all accounts, and um, through secondary accounts and tertiary accounts, through the documentary, it, 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 it's something that was that was explained regularly about him. So we can take into account, yes, he was a very nice guy. Um, but no matter how well a parent thinks they know their child, they don't. There's always an aspect to human being, um, regardless of the relationship that you keep to yourself. Everyone has a certain amount of privacy. And I think as well as Trevor's parents thought they knew him, there's a very probable chance that there's a side to him that they, they didn't know. And that side that they didn't know could have been an element that would have exposed them to harm and danger and that could have led to his disappearance. I have absolutely nothing to back this up. I don't, I'm not going to take it at face value that he was very good with money um, and that he was a perfect human being and that he wasn't capable of getting involved in something that he shouldn't be involved in. To disappear like that, either it was a complete accident, as Sean said, he could have been run over. I don't think he fell into a canal. The fact that there was someone outside that office building at a quarter past three that's unaccounted for <clears throat> and, is, and was there for a considerable period of time would lead me to believe that he has some connection to Trevor. He knew where he would be um, and that he could have been applying pressure on it or warning him about something that would happen to him if he didn't go along with what was expressed to him. And um, that's another thing as well, because, um, you know, I, I, if anyone is listening, from, from, you know, is connected, uh, we're, we're not here to add to anyone's misery or, or whatever. You know, we're, we're just discussing <laughs> we, theories. I, I 
I think we've done that already in previous podcasts. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we, we have a catalogue of that. But yeah, yeah, you, you know, uh, with Trevor as well, it could be the other side of it, like myself, where, you know, somebody's trying to have this master plan. Oh, we can do this, we can do that. And go, no, I, I don't want anything in on that. I, I have a good thing going here. I'm not going to, you know, do something stupid. And that maybe got him into trouble. So there's also that other side to it as well. If, if that is the case, you know, it could be the fact that he is... He was so straight and narrow that it got him into trouble because people are people and there are horrible people out there and they will try to exploit something and put pressure on. But yeah, the fact that somebody follows somebody and if you look how the guy walks as well in the CCTV footage and it is it, it is out there, something not quite right there. Like he looks like he's staggering. Is He looks like he's grabbing something. You know, you know when you see him walking in the rain, he does look like he's actually sort of reaching for something, you know, when you, when you see him and you, you see Trevor walking with the umbrella. Yeah. But see, the, the thing is there, even even if he did attack him there and then, which it was still an urban area, you know, so he would have had to coerce them into walking somewhere with him or maybe that car came afterwards or something. There would have been people on the street there and there, there was people after them. As far as I know, don't quote me on that now, but I think there was yeah. people following after him as well. I think it was a couple who all have all been cleared now. But um, uh, I, I suppose I, something else that I we didn't mention was it could have been something now. I'm not employing anything here, but, you know, if let's say he was Trevor was interested in drugs, let's say he wanted uh, cocaine or something like that. You yeah, know, we do know he did like a night out. You know, he did like the party. Now, I'm not employing anything. You know, I want to be careful about this friends or family listening to. But, you know, just the fact that the, what, this guy seemed like he was. We could possibly say that he was waiting for him, you know, for for one way or another. He looked like he was there to meet Trevor. Now, he could have been just waiting for a lift, whatever. But, like, let's say it was a drug deal. Let's say he was a drug dealer. Um, could Trevor have gone in? Uh, again, I suppose I why we go into his office, though. But um, could he have done something, bought drugs off the guy, do a due to meet down the street or even back at Trevor's apartment? We don't really know because the guy never came forward. So, I mean, any theory is as, you know, useful as another theory. So we don't, we still don't really know. It's just, it's quite the frustrating. Thing is, the thing is, you know, those two, um, those two colleagues that were working the night shift. Yeah. You'd like to think that they would have at least looked at your man, that they would have seen him or asked him what he was doing there. Because given, given where they worked, I think it's plausible to assume that the vast majority of people that worked in that bill and they would have been familiar with. And to casually walk by someone that's standing outside a building at quarter past three in the morning or half three in the morning um, with their hood up. Yeah, but then, it's just, then again, it's just bizarre. I just find that strange. It, it would be, but then again, it is lashing rain and, and there are no taxis. So it, it, the night that was in it, he might not have been as suspicious as any other night. And now it is, that is a good, an interesting point that none of the others mentioned this guy. Like those two guys that, you know, who I said were workmates, they should, presumably would have got a good look at this guy if he was around at that time. They don't mention him. Well, as far as we know, they don't mention him. Um, um, I don't think Trevor mentioned to his work colleague about the guy yeah. outside. So there's, it's just a lot of, things still up in the air really and as well you know Trevor seemed like a very laid back fella yeah where I would be you know there's a guy out there I, I you know I'd have my spidey senses going on going there's a guy out there I, what the what's he doing out there can you have a look or you know like that's just me I'm a very suspicious person of people like I don't trust anybody uh, yeah. really you know and that's unfortunate but that's just from experience um, but maybe, but he seemed quite laid back as well, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. He's had a few drinks, so maybe he didn't think anything of it to, to mention it. Um, what I found really interesting, fascinated with disappearing, uh, cases of disappearance like, like this, you know, and I know it's a morbid fascination as well, but I just thought the Gardy investigation just from, from what I've seen of it I don't know the internet so from what I've seen of it on the documentaries on the absolutely atrocious program from 2015 I thought it was terrible and oh, some more better you mean the uh, Donald McIntyre there was it yeah, yeah TV3 thing I thought it was absolutely yeah, I, awful I think, I think that's the first time I ever heard about Trevor Daly and Donald McIntyre is a terrible journalist <laughs> he is He's absolutely brutal. Yeah, absolutely he. Brutal. Did you ever see? Did you ever see the um, 
he did this series called Dangerous Cities, uh, where he travelled yeah. around, and he did one in Dublin. And it was basically he it was absolutely ridiculous. And um, by the end of the the episode, and it's an hour long. You make it out to believe that Dublin was a violent, dangerous city where people are constantly drunk and people are constantly fighting each other. And all the lad did for this for that episode was get in the back of fucking ambulance that went all the way up to Finglas um, and stopped off at a house where people had been drinking. And that is the perception he gave of Warren. I went, pal, that's a load of rubbish. I've been out in Dublin plenty of times and I've rarely seen a fight. Dublin is a very safe city for the most part. Yeah. The way he portrayed it was an absolute farce. And I saw, like I, I, I kind of respected him before that. But once I saw that, I went, no, pal, you're full yeah. of shit. Um, because you know. Like, you just know. And I, I do have a distinct memory of watching that Trevor Dealey episode he did and thinking, all right, I felt very sorry for Trevor Dealey, but just the yeah. way they put it together was poor. Like, he, kept say, he, he kept sorry. saying before... Sorry, sorry to cut across here, but he kept saying, um, like, and find out with my team, you know, some retired, some lady who's done a psychology and crimin- criminology or a degree, master's in criminology, and a fella who doesn't work for Scotland Yard anymore, and find out what my team, you know, my, you know, your team, I'm, I'm sure it's, te- I'm sure it's ITV's team, you know, is throwing these guys at you for a fiver, and find out what they think, and, and can we uncover the mystery, and he's just, it's like what mystery? It's it's just footage. He went to a party, he disappeared, and and that's it. Like that, there there is nothing else. And you're trying to sell us that you have like you've got the Rosetta Stone in your hand. You're gonna whip it out of your arse pocket. You know, I found something that the guard they haven't. But I'm gonna make you watch this program for an hour with ads. And I just I remember just sitting there watching it for the first time. You know, because I wouldn't have seen it on TV three. I just go, this is horseshit. And yeah, and he actually showed the wrong footage as well on the CCTV. So yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. They showed the the walk walkmates, and it sort of implied that it was these people were involved as well. But yeah, yeah. I well, just Donald McIntyre. For you. He's a sensationalist, isn't he? Like he just yeah. Like, yeah. Say, look, and do you know what? If you've got access to exclusive footage and all this kind of stuff, and you're trying to get into the cat, you know, don't be sensationalist. Just you know, that's irresponsible. Now I know someone could. Or you were probably doing a little bit out here, but you know he he's going like he's advertising. You know we're, we're speculating. We're have we're we're talking about our opinions on it. He's actually going on like he's he he's got a sus lads. You know like I've, yeah, I really had. Oh, it was just horseshit. There was one on top fives which is very good. Uh, I think I I sent to you lads uh, with the Welsh guy doing it. That was very good. Uh, very well put together. Yeah, that's that's the one I watched. In first time he did put up. It was a very well made documentary, yeah. but. He absolutely butchered the arse out of some of the arse names. He did. He not, does not, even, not, a, not even remotely close. Like, for a Welsh person as well, um, it was an English person that kind of go, all right, okay, but for a Welsh person, that like Celt, to not even make the effort to see how yeah. you pronounce that name, <laughs> it was funny. Uh, it, it, it was bad, but yeah, it was very well put together. And, you know, uh, he does go, you know, he is... A little bit of sens- sensationalist is why he loves his conspiracy theories. A lot does that, but it was very good, you know, especially for a YouTube channel. It was really, really good, and, and that's the one. If anyone's watching this, I'd recommend you watch it. Is it is a fascinating case. I I think that with the Gardaí, I, I do think they they handle it quite poorly. I mean, there's evidence there. His last known recording uh, where he rings the guy, and they they allowed the fella yeah. to delete it. Yeah, that's right. That that's right. Oh God, yeah, the voicemail. Yeah, yeah, that's- yeah. You, yeah. you, you know, you have to, you know, that's basic detective work, I'd imagine. I don't know. I mean, it, it, you know, I, th- I think as well, I think Trevor Dealey is a victim of the time. Um, if it was London 2000, perhaps, you know, like, or New York 2000, we'd know a bit more. There'd be more cameras, there'd be more CCTV. If it was Dublin 2019, you'd know a lot more. You'd have GPS technology, the phone, that kind of stuff. Um, the fact that they have one street corner, because I think back then, after 48 hours, a lot of those CCTV cameras wiped um, and they yeah. start again. And they were poor quality. And I just think he's so unfortunate that people thought that, you know, ah, young lad, he's hung over. Uh, even his boss said it, ah, oh, sure, like, he, you know, he's hung over from the party. Um, we'll, we'll talk till Monday. And, you know, he was gone that weekend. He lost precious time. Mm-hmm. Um, they couldn't track him. Not like you can track on your phone now. Well, well, his, uh, phone, his 
Scott's phone apparently was still registered as being active on the Sunday after he disappeared, though, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. it rang out. Sister, apparently. I think, was ringing him. And it yeah. rang out. And That's... they say that that kind of excludes him being in the water because it wouldn't ring with oh, us. Oh, absolutely. But, yeah, but then they say, I forget where I've seen this, but they say that that tone that you hear when you call someone isn't necessarily their phone ringing. It's just what you hear on your end. So it is possible. It's not completely impossible that it, it, you're just hearing that sound and it's just uh, having difficulty connecting to the network or something, that, you know? That, that the phone could have conceivably been off. Yeah. All right, uh, okay. Could have been off, could have been in the water even. Like it's just, there's, there's no 100% way of saying all oh, right it, it, his phone was still on for the next three days um and i suppose we kind of assume that you know the last cctv footage of him was just over bagger street bridge that somehow what happened around there which is not necessarily true it, it could have been way further up it could have been nearer his house it's yeah, just that that's where the cctv footage ends so you know we don't really know anything really you know um yeah. And I suppose there's the one thing that we we haven't mentioned, and it's a very morbid thing, is that could he have been suicidal? Could it have been a suicide attempt by him? Um, you know, but then oh, chances the are Alaska. the body. Yeah, with something. Yeah, um, you know, with in terms of young men, Trevor's age is an epidemic in Ireland and uh, all across the world. You know, um, young men killing themselves. But it's, I mean, it is a it is a possibility and. The fact that he was a happy-go-lucky guy isn't necessarily, an, you know, a reason for him not to do that. But I don't think along those lines because the fact that nobody was found, I just yeah. think it would have been torn up at this stage if, if it was something yeah. like that. I, I, yeah. I need a lot going for him as well, you know. I mean, but yet again, of course, that doesn't mean that a person wouldn't take so, such action. Yeah. But, uh, Certainly not. Yeah, I, I don't know. And that's another thing in Alaska, the, the girl, they went actually, you know, you saw the girl in Alaska, the guard, he went over there, members of the family went over there and they they came across nothing, um, you know, suspicious or, or uh, um, anything going on there that it was untoward. I just, what I don't like about the case with the guard, I don't like how uh, opaque it is. There's not a lot of transparency. Yeah. You know? Well, they, they said, you know, they drained the area that they assumed he might have fallen in at the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe even a few weeks afterwards. And that was it. It was as if to say, oh, well, he's not in there. So that's kind of the end of that. Yeah. I For me, that doesn't that doesn't cut it for me. You know, yeah. I because I, you don't listen. It's a stormy night. Um, you know, winds, stuff can happen, shit can, you know, st- stuff can get to places that you think, what's that doing here? Because it's it, it travels through a storm. You yeah. don't know. And, you know, I, I, the guy that was investigated, the guard, I don't know the guy, don't know him prefer- professionally or personally, but yeah, just f- for me, it, it, I, I didn't feel satisfied, you know, if I was... You know, maybe if you're, if you're, you know, the parents, you know, because they dealt with them on day day to day basis. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have felt overly satisfied. I, uh, I got that impression with uh, his brother. Um, he seemed to have that sort of attitude as well. That he just, just wasn't really. It can't really be seen to be saying that, but he kind of get. I got the impression from him anyway that he just wasn't really impressed with what they no. But then again, in saying that, like, there's so little to go off that. I, I suppose where do you start like you know you look around the shops for more CCTV footage and stuff you do you knock on doors you ask people but you know they put out the footage they put out the, the guy of interest no one came forward no one put him up um, so I suppose you, you do wind up sometimes unfortunately you do come to a dead end and it's just that's all the information we have and they, they do think that people out there do know Somebody out there obviously knows what happened to him, and they haven't come forward. And there's no uh, indication that they will. I mean, the thing in uh, uh, Chapel Lizard was the closest thing, the closest, the, the biggest development that I've seen anyway. And it turned out to not. Now that doesn't mean that it has nothing to do with it. But uh, it, it, the, the thing know. for me, the thing for me, they found drugs, they found a gun. Yeah. Okay, and there is a lot of gangland activity in Dublin, and it has been for some time. We're only now peeling back the onion on that. And the fact that 
in the line of work he was in, asset management, a lot of money, gangs. It's not a million miles away, you know? No, yeah. but it, it, it's a very, very thin, very, very thin correlation between the two, don't you? Yeah, because, no. Just, just because you work in a bank and there's a gun and drugs found 20 no, miles but, away, doesn't but mean there that was, there's a ten, tenable connection between the two. I don't. There, I there was a whole, but well, you have to understand though, and it wasn't in the papers a lot. There was a whole host of people working in banks around the mid two thousands. There was a lot of people getting done with tiger kidnappings. There were and in the book and in the book as well. But he so wasn't. This, he, he wasn't in a position of seniority whereby he would have had access to cash. Um, yeah, but he, maybe he, that, he worked. He worked in IT. Like he was. I know. He, he, he might have been able to, you know, make something else disappear. Transactions, you know, he might have access. I'm not sure exactly. Like, yeah. Uh, but you, but you have to understand though, Jay, is that okay? Let's say I hear, oh, you work in asset management. You you have one of those computer machines there. You know, it's the year 2000. My understanding of computers aren't great. Let's say, so you you can clearly just put 10 million squillion pounds into my account, can't you? Well, actually, it doesn't work that way. Absolutely. But, you, but, but that's what I mean. Like it doesn't. It doesn't. For someone to think, for for somebody to act on somebody, let's say for that, it doesn't mean the thing that I think you can do is impossible. If I think you can do it, and I'm not going to take no for an answer, I'm still going to action that. If that makes sense, like even yeah, though it's no, impossible, no, I, we're in agreement. It's just it's what yeah. I mentioned. It's what I mentioned about 15 minutes ago. I actually do think he would have been capable of doing that. Absolutely, 100. Yeah. Hundred percent. It's the only way I can rationalise his disappearance. And I know people do disappear out of the blue, out of thin air. They're just gone, and it's very hard to rationalise. And that could very, that could very possibly happen in this case. But given, as you're trying to say, given for who he worked for, given his expertise, um, it's possible. But just because there was, like Dublin is still, um, notorious to some extent for that for gangland crime. Things haven't changed yeah. too much in 19 years. Um, no. It's a lot more. It's a lot more subtle and hidden nowadays than it was back then. They've they've changed the ways in which they carry out their business. They're a lot harder to catch now. Um, but like Castle Knock and and a bank on Leeson Street to put connections between the two and Trevor Dealey's that connection. No, I uh, it's too much of a stretch for me. Well, I suppose they they could be two separate sort of lines. You know, the gangland might not be. You know, because it was wasn't there a link between that um that girl that was killed, Sinead Kelly, um two years previously, to a Crumlin Crumlin gang, um and the guy who, uh, you know, said said uh, he was out in Castle Knock, he suggested that it was the same people who killed this girl was would have been the same people who killed Trevor. Yeah, so, but he was he was shown to be a liar, though, wasn't he? He was shown that what he said was true, but it's. I mean, there is a possibility the body was there. I mean, speculating here and moved, you know, there is always that possibility that it was a temporary burial site. Um, yeah. Well, like but, in, fairness, yeah. in fairness, that witness would have been very easy to attack because you could just say, for example, that this lad has been caught red-handed and in order to get out of it, he's conceived of some plot um, to offer us information about Trevor Dealey in order to get a reduced sentence. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely that. Yeah. yeah, and the fact that the drugs and guns found yeah. was probably yeah. useful for something else anyway. You know, so absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, um, like I, I do know. get what Dunny's trying to say, but the, the cast knock thing and Trevor Daly, no, absolutely not. not so, so if if I was to ask you, <laughs> I think yeah, we we'll lost round. If you were to say right now what you think happened, considering everything we talked about, what would you think would be your most Maybe not what you think, but what you're kind of leaning towards more so of what happened to Trevor. I I think due to the fact that he was bright, he was intelligent, anything that he would have done on a computer would have been very easy for him to manipulate and keep hidden from people. Um, therefore, I don't know how it would have happened. But it's very possible that he would have said to someone here, look, I can do this, I can do X, Y, and Z. I want to, I want to, I want to get paid some money to do it. Um, but in saying that, if he did receive uh, financial inducement to commit a crime, 
um, how he would have hidden that money, I don't know, because wherever there is money, generally there's a trace of it. And I think that's an angle that Gardy would have looked at. I don't know how he would have been able to, to hide his money unless could, he found could it. He have been, sorry, could off. he have been maybe expecting money afterwards himself, you know, after everything cleared and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, I just, I just don't know how that person... The man in black was outside the building at that time. I know there's a taxi trike, and I, I I know it was rain, and he might have been trying to stay out the rain or whatever. Um, it, it just seems highly suspicious to me that the journey in America for a week to see a girl that he barely knew, I think, is strange as well. Um, I think most likely he got involved in the, with the wrong people. Um, they expected something of him. They got they got into an altercation. They an accident probably occurred in trying to threaten him whereby he was severely injured, and then they got rid of the body. Um, that's what I think most likely happened. But I suppose that kind of ticks I've, I've, most I've of the boxes, really, a bit. It, it does, though, but I've got nothing to prove it, though. It's highly yeah. suspicious. It's highly suspicious. I could be talking through my arse. I kind no, of lean towards there. that myself, um, Jay. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Donnie? You, you t- what you t- suspect might happen. I, I wouldn't say what you think happens, but what you're kind of leaning towards as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's two, two trains of thought. There's, I think I'm, you know, there is the whole, is it just an unfortunate accident? Uh, somebody knocked him down by mistake, pissed. It's a rainy night or he's walked down in front of a car by mistake, you know, uh, even though he was, I mean, Jesus, look, I've almost not walked down in front of a car sober as a judge. These things happen. It's a rainy night, poor visibility. And the guy, you know, the guy's left him for dead. Or he's fallen into the river, or he's knocked him into the canal, and you know after seventy two hours, when the guardy or seventy or ninety six hours or whatever it was when he eventually drained, I said, "Oh well, we, we definitely find the body there," uh, and he didn't. But yet again, I wasn't fully confident. I wasn't satisfied in watching the guards speak and and the way they were. Just to me, I just didn't get that impression. And as you said, John, the brother didn't give the impression he was. Or what did he, was he, did he see something that he shouldn't have seen? Did he get dragged into something that he should, that he didn't want to get dragged into? Or he got dragged into something that he shouldn't have got dragged into? And it's all that to, to consequence and, uh, you know, threatening and, and accidentally somebody, you know, something's happened and they've had to dispose of it or, or whatever, you know. Um, it, it's the year 2000. Unfortunately, technology and time, if it was now, you know the gangland disappearances and all that now are a lot more. You know the the investigation into them are a lot more sophisticated. I'd imagine because it's a lot more common. They're aware of it now, so they're on to it now. Well, in two thousand, he wouldn't have been. You know, there was still that little small town mentality in Dublin at the time. You know, the the big town, I should say. You know, um, of Ireland in the year two thousand before it's matured into this sort of more sophisticated city, more metropolitan city that it is now. And, you know, the Guardian are more sophisticated, technology is more sophisticated. I, I think he's a victim of time. I really do. Can I just um, point out something that there was a, as far as I know, he's still missing, that Icelandic guy went missing in Dublin. I thought the circumstances were similar enough to, to draw my attention. Are you familiar with that, Donny, over there? Yeah, that was uh, John John uh, Johnson, I think was his name. Oh, that was enough, wasn't it? Or it is yeah, recent. it was this uh, just last year or just this year, I think. No, uh, I, I, and I'll, put, I'll link it all anyway under the the show anyway. Well, but this well, is a guy who went then. missing. He was uh, traveling to Ireland. There was CCTV footage of him. It's very unique guy. He's very tall, six foot, and um, he was just like tenuous sort of. A tidbits of information basically that he was he, I think he enjoyed playing poker or something like that but it was something that definitely echoed Trevor Deedy in some ways anyway you know uh, it's not off you know, Ireland has a lot of disappearances particularly women uh, we might actually touch on that in another episode the uh, the triangle of missing women in Ireland um, but yeah I mean like a guy gone missing Seemingly, and this guy was broad daylight. Now, I'm not saying like it's connected, but it is possible for someone else to go missing in an okay. urban environment, you know? I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware of this guy, but that is something we're going to look into and we're going mm-hmm. to discuss. Um, so definitely, you know, send that on. Uh, but yeah, to, to answer your question, I know I'm going through the weeds, though. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I would lean more towards what Luxie said there. 
um, some you know something doesn't fit. It, it seems like a disappearance, a purposeful disappearance. He's he's got involved in something, or someone's tried to get involved in something he, sh- he didn't want to or shouldn't have. And uh, yeah, and I think he's he's just paid for it with his life. Yeah, um, I suppose it's it's as good a theory as anything, really, is it, based on what we have to go on. Yeah, uh, and it's it must be absolutely. And as I said, I know we're doing this, uh, we're talking about this, and you know, there is anyone uh, from the family who's connected or, or knows Trevor, you know, or you know, and, or even if Trevor's listening to this himself, you, you just don't know. You, you, you know, we're not here. We're not trying to cause any more pain and suffering for the family. We're just summarising where three yeah, gobstides just, just giving our opinion on it. So yeah. we have nothing to, to base uh, any of this on. No evidence whatsoever, um, genuinely, you know. But sure, there's nothing out there really to, to, to base anything on. It, the guy literally has just disappeared off the face of the earth. Or so it would seem. So, you know, our sympathies and thoughts still go out with, with Trevor's family and I really hope to get some sort of closure or he has some sort of closure on it because I, I, I don't even want to imagine um, what they're going through uh, right there. So, lads, uh, I think we'll leave it there on that one. Yeah. Um, I think we've discussed that as much as we can. Um, but yeah, Trevor, if you're out there, you know, we hope you're okay and... You know, hopefully your fa- your family can get some sort of closure on this. So trying to end the podcast on a on a higher note, I suppose. Um, we have a new act, brand new act that's uh, come up in the last few weeks. Uh, there's some good friends of mine, a band called Madra Luna. I've been to see one of their shows and they're absolutely fantastic live. And if you're in the London area, you can catch them on the 30th of May and you can also catch them on the 22nd of June. They're in Islington. You can also find Madra Luna on Facebook and they have a new single coming out. But actually, Sean, you, you really like this song uh, we've got playing in the background here called Senseless which in a way actually perfectly describes the uh, uh, topic we've just been discussing. Uh, the band ha- do not share the opinions that we have here uh, on the show. Uh, we don't want to condemn them before they get started, but they're a great bunch of lads and I really like their music. And our new single Lola dropped last week and we're going to play out the rest of the show with their new single. You can find their songs on Spotify and any other streaming devices. Uh, please hit them up. If you're in the London area, please check them out live. And uh, also, if you want to promote any new music or you have a band or an actor or anything, get in touch and we want to do our best to try and promote any new talent. That's It doesn't matter where you are, Dublin, London, New York, it doesn't matter, all the big places and uh, we'll get you here in the podcast. Anyway, have a lovely week, folks. We'll talk to you again later. Days won't she say well, if I'm clean they'll kill you Tying the hours constructing the way holding back the minutes like fending a quake Lola's coming home now from another city another town your Lola smile she comes Comes
slowly out of the room Called for her to come back I spoke to soon She's already on her way And we don't want to face the day, no Slowly's coming 